So um, I'm Vikram Sehdi. I'm a senior architect at Adobe. I work in the developer platforms organization at Adobe. And I am actually these days working on having introducing advanced capabilities into our platforms, such as GitOps-based deployments using Argo, infrastructure provisioning using Crossplane and Argo, and also building an AI ops platform for our developer uh, for in, into our de de developer platform. With me, I have Nima and Gaurav. Gaurav, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. My name is Gaurav, senior solution architect at AWS. And for the last couple of years, I've been working with Adobe on several initiatives and happy to be here to share our collaboration story related to Crossplane. Nima? Good evening, everyone. My name is Nima Kaviani. I'm a principal solutions architect with AWS. I work with our customers on running open source technologies, in particular CNCF technologies on top of AWS. What we're presenting here is the result of six months of work between AWS and Adobe. But this is not specific to Adobe. We would love to work with you and your companies on similar solutions as well. So wait until the end of the, the talk, and I'll tell you how we can actually engage in collaborations. Thank you, both of you. So to, for the topic of today, we are going to talk about how we at Adobe, with AWS's help, were able to enable GitOps-based application and infrastructure provisioning using Crossplane and Argo. Let's get started. So we have a packed agenda today. We are going to talk about Adobe's previous state, how it looks like, and the pain points associated. Then we're going to do a quick overview of uh, Adobe's internal developer platform, followed by a deep dive into deployments using Argo projects and also infrastructure provisioning using Crossplane and Argo. Thereafter, Gaurav is going to take you into multi-tenancy and security requirements and uh, the solutions associated with them. And finally, we'll try to wrap it up by talking about or comparing the before and the after experiences uh, for our service teams and our platform teams, and also talk about some of the challenges and the unknowns that we still have with this particular solution. So with that, let's talk about the combo meal. What's a combo meal doing over here, <laughs> if you were to ask? So imagine that you go to your favorite burger store or you know, your favorite burger joint and ask for a combo meal. And if the, uh, you know, the attendant that, that you find over there say that, oh, we only do burgers, we don't do combo meals, and you need to bring your own fries and soda, how would you feel? That's odd, right? These days, everyone is kind of like you know, providing a combo meal. So compare it with the current situation that we have at most burger joints. Where you ask for a, a combo meal, and they say that, can we give you any sauces or can we give you any smoothies alongside, right? So that's, the, that's something that you know, uh, we have been trying to sort of do as a platform team. So, um, but before that, looking at this diagram, how many, how many are you feeling hungry already, right? It's 5.30 in the evening, but I'm also feeling hungry. But so the main thing over here, or the main point that we're trying to say over here is that how we at Adobe are transitioning from the model on the left, where we are providing some piecemeal related functionality or capabilities to our uh, client teams, and moving over to providing package solutions with you know, multiple things combined together. So let's see how this applies in context of Adobe as we move forward. So let's look at some of the pain points. So as we have talked, as we've been talking to multiple service teams inside of Adobe, we realize that there are a lot of pain points that they are experiencing. They're using the GitOps based solution that we currently have, but each team is doing infrastructure provisioning in their own very way. They have custom tooling and they have a learning curve associated with it. And they have to track their infrastructure and their non uh, uh, the compute resources in a different fashion because they have their own solutions. And as far as the platform team is concerned, even though you know, we have the GitOps-based workflows and we are able to enforce multi-tenancy and security for that particular solution, but there is no visibility into the non-compute resources or the infrastructure resources. And it's very hard to you know, do the troubleshooting with the client teams when they run into issues because of the lack of visibility. So but before we move forward, I have a question for you, Neema. So uh, do service developers and teams outside of Adobe also have like, you know, similar set of problems? Yeah, you know, yeah good question. Yeah, so 
like I said, we work with a lot of AWS customers, right? But before I answer Vikram's question, I want to take it to you guys, right? How many of you are using GitOps uh, for your deployments at the moment? Okay, good, 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 good yes. crap. How many of you are dealing with multi-tenancy problems when you're doing GitOps for your users? Not many. Okay, not many, but there are a few. How many of <laughs> you are dealing with inconsistencies when you actually have teams, different parts of the organizations, and then developers moving from one team to another when it comes to using infrastructure resources, doing application work? Yeah. So that is the problem. The problem is that there is inconsistency when it comes to launching infrastructure resources. There is inconsistency in tracking the compute resources or non-compute resources. There is lack of visibility into how the infra teams can manage and identify all the resources that are spun up by the different teams, right? So there is a lot of appeal for a unified and consistent model that can be put in place so that these problems can be addressed. And now, you listed a lot of questions and a lot of problems here, Vikram, right? I'm curious how you came across these problems. How did you identify them with Adobe? Yeah, so we were talking to a lot of teams, as I mentioned, you know, uh, within, within Adobe, like, you know, as part of being the platform team, we have to deal with, you know, the clients day in, day out, and have a few more members of the platform team over here. They will also tell you, like, you know, uh, how much of their time goes into talking to them. But we also did a survey. You know, and uh, just to make sure that we are thinking in the right direction based on the anecdotal data that we have, we wanted to collect some empirical data as well. So based on the survey, I think the results were overwhelming. Around 90% of the people, they wanted a solution from the platform team. More than two thirds of them, they wanted it to be integrated with the existing workflows, and they wanted this solution as soon as possible in 2022 itself. So there was a need and we decided to plug the gap. Awesome. Okay. So <clears throat> let's move forward and talk about some of the solution requirements that we came up with, given, given the platform that we have and the multi-tenancy and the security requirements that we have. We came up with a uh, set of requirements for this particular solution, but they apply to you know, presumably uh, you know, any of the solution that we have for our, pl for our platform. And these solution requirements are actually generic enough, as you would see, that it applies to a lot of your use cases as well, hopefully. So the first uh, requirement is around standardization. We need this solution to be a standard solution for the whole of Adobe with best practices built in. The next one, our uh, platform is based on Kubernetes. So we wanted the solution to be Kubernetes native and the solution to run natively on Kubernetes. The third one, you know, our existing CICD solution that we are offering to the clients is based on GitOps, so we wanted this solution to be, for infrastructure provisioning, to be GitOps friendly as well. And multi-tenancy and security, in any case, we are, we are going, deep, we are doing a deep dive later in, the, in this particular session around them. These are very key requirements for our platform. Um, Multi-cloud is another requirement. Right now we are running on AWS, we are running on on-prem clusters, and there are other cloud providers also that we are running on top of. So multi-cloud multi is definitely a key requirement for us at Adobe. Um, extensibility needs to be you know, built in from the word go. As a platform team, no matter how hard we try to you know, build everything from the platform team itself, you know, we know that you know, we're not gonna be successful in meeting all the requirements that all the teams have. So the key thing is that the client's team can also you know, uh, contribute to this particular solution and extend this particular solution in a way that is suited for their requirements. So that was also something that we you know, kept in mind as we built the solution. And finally, industry alignment. You know, we want to leverage the work that is being done by the industry, and also we're looking for opportunities to be able to contribute upstream in the open source community. Okay, so quick question, a quick check. How many of you are able to, let's say, relate to three or four or more requirements out of this particular list? Okay, that's great, quite a few of you. Okay, so with that, let's look at you know, Adobe's services landscape. How you know, our internal developer platform is placed and you know, how you know, the, the various clouds that Adobe offers are placed. So at a very high level, some of you would be knowing that we have Document Cloud, Creative Cloud, and Experience Cloud as the main three offerings that Adobe provides. 
right? These uh, clouds are, you know, um, no surprise, they are comprised of different services and different, uh, you know, products that you're already aware of, such as Photoshop, Illustrator, and Lightroom, and Behance, all the, you know, uh, you know prominent products that it, uh, a lot of you must be using day in and day out. And these uh, products and services in turn are dependent on this uh, content platform, data platform, AI and ML platform that we have built over so many years. And the main point is that our internal developer platform mm -hmm. is sitting uh, you know, below all of these clouds and all of these platforms and all of these products and services. And all of these products and services and the platforms in turn are running on top of an internal developer platform that we are building. And in turn, our developer platform is based on AWS, and it's running on top of our on-prem clusters, and we have other cloud providers also that we are supporting. Now, let's do a quick double-click uh, uh, double into our developer platform, internal developer platform. What you see over here on the screen is you know, a lot of boxes, but these are actually building blocks. And you can think of these as capabilities that are provided by our internal developer platform. And you know, as you can see over here, these are, there is a certain color coding that is happening. There's yellow, there's green, there's blue. So you know, at a very high level, these are development phases, right? The yellow color represents discovery and creation. And these capabilities, they actually help the developers get started with the platform. So you can think of these as day zero activities, if you will. And the green color uh, capabilities are all about integration and deployments. So they help teams uh, get their applications up and running onto the platform and onto the cloud. And you can think of these as day one activities, if you will. And the blue colored boxes are all about operations and improvements, and these help the client teams manage and maintain their applications on top of a, on top of a platform on a day-to-day -day basis. And the, you can think of these as day two activities. And today, we are going to focus on these three capabilities. Infrastructure provisioning and orchestration, delivery and deployment, and workflow orchestration. So uh, since we are going to talk about Argo and Crossplane in a little bit more detail in our architecture, let's do a quick introduction to the Argo projects as well. So what are Argo projects? They are a collection of open pro source projects in CNCF that enable GitOps-based production-grade uh, application deployments on top of Kubernetes. And what are GitOps-based deployments? GitOps-based deployments are paradigms and practices that make sure that Git is the source of truth, which means that you define your um, uh, your desired state in Git and let it sync with the actual state on the Kubernetes clusters. And how do we do that? We actually use all the four projects on our, uh, in, our de in, in our internal developer platform in order to achieve this. And we'll go a little bit deeper into all of these uh, four projects as we look at the architecture. But uh, at a very high level, Argo CD is for the continuous delivery. Argo workflows is for uh, you know, the provisioning workflows and uh, you know, representing it as a series of steps using DAGs. And Argo events is there for enabling you know, the catching of events and you know, triggering the workflows. And Argo rollouts is for enabling advanced deployment capabilities. So a um, uh, quick question. I think we talked about you know, people using GitOps, but how many of you are using actually Argo in your day-to-day uh, -day workflows? That's great. Quite a few of you are already using it. That's great. And I'm sure that you know, if you're keeping yourself updated, I'm sure you are, you would have seen that Argo actually became a graduated project only last week. So you know, that's, that's pretty, pretty nice to see. Okay, let's also do a quick introduction to Crossplane. So what is Crossplane? Crossplane is an open source CNCF project, which is uh, providing a cloud native control plane framework for extending Kubernetes APIs for use cases such as infrastructure provisioning, but also for building higher level uh, abstractions and control planes. And in terms of the infrastructure resource provisioning, we use it for creating, updating, and deleting the cloud infrastructure resources, but are also planning to use it 
for uh, creating self-healing control planes on top. So it's just not limited to infrastructure provisioning. Infrastructure provisioning is just the starting point over here. So how many of you have known, uh, know about Crossplane or are using Crossplane already in your organizations? Okay, that's also in a pretty good number, actually. Good to see. Okay, so with that, you know, I think let's go and look at how we have um, organized ourselves, our, our, archi our architecture or our infrastructure in a hub and spoke kind of a model. So at the center, we have a hub cluster. So this hub cluster is actually, um, you know, the central cluster where each of the client teams, they get a tenant hub namespace, as you can see on screen. Argo CD, Argo events, and Argo workflows are installed in this, uh, this cluster, and so is Crossplane. So Crossplane is also installed on this hub cluster. So what are so if this is the hub cluster, what are the spokes? The spokes are the fleet of remote clusters um, that we have uh, on our side. So we have AWS clusters, we have our own um, you know data center clusters, and also you know we run on other clouds as well. So each of these remote clusters, as you can see, they have these tenant remote namespaces. So what's important over here is that one tenant can have n number of remote namespaces. So it's not that uh, you know, the, each of the teams have one dedicated cluster assigned to them. They can decide to run their application on multiple clusters across the board. So they, can, they get one hub namespace, but multiple remote namespaces they can actually go ahead and provision. Also important over here is that Argo rollouts is actually installed on the tenant remote clusters, whereas the rest of the Argo components are installed on the hub cluster. Okay, so uh, the hub cluster connects to these remote clusters and makes sure that you know, the deployments can happen, but where is it getting the code from? Hub cluster actually connects to GitHub Corp where all of the code for um, all the depositories and the clients, uh, it resides, and the hub cluster choreographs the deployments from Git to the remote clusters. So there are also tenant-owned cloud accounts, as you can imagine. The, the tenants, they provision their infrastructure uh, you know, in these AWS accounts, and the internal developer platform, it provides a way for the client containers running in the, uh, you know, the remote namespaces to be able to connect to these cloud accounts and access this, those resources. Okay, now let's get to the meat of the discussion, which is about deployments using Argo projects, and then we'll go to Crossplane as well. Okay, so we'll start with where we left off in the previous diagram. We have GitHub Corp, we have Hub Cluster, we have Remote Clusters, we have the tenant-owned AWS account as well. And one important thing to note over here is that the resources, which is a queue and a lambda as being shown in the tenant-owned AWS account, they are already pre-provisioned right now. Um, but we'll see like, you know, what is the significance of that a little later. Uh, and in the uh, corporate GitHub or you know, uh, in Git, we have one client app repo and one client deploy repo for each tenant. And this is, again, for people who are already familiar with GitOps. This is kind of a best practice in the GitOps world. We have you know, two repos uh, for one service uh, that we have. Uh, in the client app repo, you have the business logic, as you can imagine. But in the client deploy repo, you have the Kubernetes manifest and the Helm charts and also the Argo manifest. Okay, and we also have a shared workflows and events repository that, is, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, this um, repository actually contains the shared Argo manifests that are shared by the different Argo manifests that are in the various repositories. So we are promoting code reuse and sharing through this shared workflows and events repository. In the hub cluster, we have something we call the provisioner or the provisioning workflow and events. So the role of this provisioner is to make sure that whatever the client needs are to make sure that the deployments happen, the provisioner is able to do. It is based on Argo workflows, as you can imagine, but it is doing a series of steps and making sure that things are set up before the deployments happen. How does it do that? It will you know, create the tenant hub namespace if it is not there. It will also create the deployment workflows and events in the tenant hub namespace uh, you know, if it is not there. And also, it will you know, create a bunch of Argo CD applications in the hub cluster 
to make sure that you know, we are able to you know, do the GitOps using them. Now, with that context, let us see how the end-to-end -end workflow works. Okay, we start with any changes that are there in the client app repo. They trigger the provisioner. So the provisioner will do its thing and figure out what needs to be provisioned. It will you know, either add more Argo CD applications or maybe take out a few Argo CD applications if needed. And thereafter, the provisioner will invoke the deployment workflow. So the deployment workflow is also based on Argo workflows. It has a series of steps, as you can imagine. You know, one of the steps, for example, could be building the image, thereafter you know, uh, scanning the image, and then doing the deployments. So the building and scanning of image, you know, we're not really going to go into at this point of time. But the deployment of the image is uh, the step where you know, uh, the deployment workflow actually writes the Git SHA into the Kubernetes manifest folder. So what, how does it help, you know, you may ask. So what's happening over here is there is an Argo CD application that is listening to any changes in this Kubernetes manifest folder. As soon as there are changes in this particular folder, Argo CD is invoked. Argo CD will try to apply the Kubernetes manifest to the tenant remote namespace. Okay? And the, uh, whatever the Kubernetes resources that have been specified in the Kubernetes manifest folder, they will come to life in the tenant remote namespace. So this is like one type of Argo CD application that was provisioned. But we also have the Argo manifest folder over here. How is that important? Um, so again, you know, when the tenant containers come up, sorry, I just uh, wanted to mention that when the tenant containers come up, they are able to access the resources in the tenant-owned AWS account, as you can see in step number six. But there's also this Argo manifest folder. If there are any changes in the Argo manifest folder, you know, again, there is an Argo CD application that is listening to this particular folder, and it um, tries to sync the state not to the remote namespace, but to the hub namespace in this particular case. So what is there in the Argo manifest folder, you may ask? The deployment workflow is there, right? The whole deployment workflow is in the Argo manifest folder. So for example, we provide a default deployment workflow to the clients, but if somebody wants to make changes to their deployment workflow and make it their own, let's say add another step for integration uh, tests, for example, they can go to the Git repositories, modify the workflow in the Git repository, and it will be applied to the tenant hub namespace. And the next time they do the deployment, it will be using the modified deployment workflow. Okay? So everything seems to be hunky-dory. What is the problem over here? You know, the problem is that we have these um, you know, resources pre-provisioned in the tenant-owned AWS account. Okay? In, in, in the terms of the analogy that we uh, talked about earlier, you're only getting the burger, right? You're not really getting the fries and the soda over here. So let's see how we can you know, solve it using uh, Argo and Crossplane in tandem. Okay? Moving on, before we actually talk about the entire workflow, let's talk a little bit about the Crossplane concepts because they can, yeah, sorry, uh, they can get a little bit confusing as you move forward. So uh, largely, you see you know, two sections over here, application concern and the platform concern. So the platform team is the one that is responsible for creating something that we call in, in the Crossplane uh, terminology as composite resources. So everything is based on, out of the con, uh, con concept of a composite resource. So the composite resource themselves are an abstract concept. They are defined by the platform team using something called as a composite resource definition, or XRD for short. These are cluster scope resources. The, com uh, the platform team also defines a comp uh, set of compositions for the composite resource. As you can see, there are multiple compositions which are possible for one composite resource. So there could be a composition for AWS, there could be a composition for another cloud, or there could be multiple compositions for the same cloud as well, depending on you know, the requirements or you know, the kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, things that the platform team wants to expose. What are these compositions? These compositions, in turn, you know, compose something called the managed resources, which are available through providers. So over here, AWS is a provider to Crossplane. 
you know, and there could be other providers as well. For example, Azure could be a provider or GCP could be a provider to cross-plane. But in, over here, we're talking specifically about AWS. So the compositions, for example, the AWS-based composition could comp uh, compose multiple managed resources from AWS. It defines like, okay, these are the three or four resources that should come up if this composite resource is instantiated. Okay? The platform team also defines something called a provider config. In very loose terms, you know, provider config, it provides access to the tenant AWS account, right? So what the platform team would do is it will get the credentials from the various client teams and create provider configs corresponding to them and add it to the hub cluster, right? So the credentials in this case could be, uh, for example, an IAM rule, which has enough permissions to be able to provision the resources. So we get those resources associated with the provider config, and Gaurav is going to talk about you know, that uh, you know, pattern in a little bit more detail as part of the multi-tenancy and security requirements. But you know, uh, this is how the, uh, the platform team or, the, uh, or Crossplane gets access to the tenant account so that it can provision the resources over there. But we also have the application concern. So how do the application teams, they use any of this? They use it using something called a composite resource claim. So in Kubernetes terms, if you, have, if you know about persistent volumes and persistent volume claims, the concept is very similar. You know, you have composite resources and composite resource claims. Composite resources are cluster scoped. Composite resource claims are name Swiss scoped. So our platform does not really allow, um, you know, uh, any clients to be able to create any cluster scope resources. So that's why we expose these composite resource claims. And the tenant apps, they use these composite resource claims. So use as in they have to author these composite resource claims by specifying that which provider config that they want to use and which composition they want to use for this particular claim. So they can pick and choose you know, which account they need to provision in, and they can also pick and choose which specific composition they want to associate with this particular uh, composite resource claim. So with this overview of the crosswind concepts, now let's do a deep dive into uh, infrastructure provisioning using Crossplane and Argo together. Okay, so we'll start with where we left off again, you know, with the Argo-based workflow. And as you can see, we already have the GitHub Corp with the client app repo and deploy repo loaded and, you know, the hub cluster with the components that we already talked about. And we also have the multi-tenant remote clusters where Argo rollouts and tenant remote namespaces is there. Now, the important thing to note over here is that in the tenant AWS account, there are no resources which are pre-provisioned, as, as opposed to, you know, when the Argo workflow, they had to be there. So we'll, we'll see, like, you know, how that magic happens. So what is the change from the previous uh, diagram or the previous workflow that we talked about? There is a cross-plane manifest folder that has popped up in the deploy repo. So this particular folder, it contains the composite resource claims that we were talking about earlier. Right? So the client teams will put in their claims in this particular folder. And also, there is a shared infra infrastructure resources repository, which is Adobe specific. Uh, but it, this re particular repository contains the composite resource definitions and also the compositions, which are published by the platform team for use by anybody uh, across Adobe. Okay, so um, you know, let's. Uh, uh, so the other thing that I wanted to mention was, as we uh, already uh, you know alluded to earlier, is that Crossplane is installed on the hub cluster, which is again a change in the previous workflow. We talked about Crossplane was not there. So with this, let's see how the end-to-end -end workflow is modified and how the resources come to life. So again, the um, the workflow starts by any changes in the app repo. It triggers the provisioning workflow and events. The change over here is that the provisioner over here is also peeping now into the shared infrastructure resources repository and trying to see that, you know, whether the composite resource that the client is asking for, it's available, it's, it's a, is it a legitimate resource that, you know, the platform team has published, and whether it is available on the hub cluster or not. So if it doesn't find that particular composite resource definition or it doesn't find the composition corresponding to it, it will install the resources dynamically 
on the hub cluster so that it's available for, for use as part of the deployment. So once it is done with that and it is doing the, the rest of the stuff, for example, you know, uh, provisioning any Argo CD applications uh, that are needed, the provisioner again invokes a deployment workflow. The rest of the workflow is pretty similar, as you can see. The state is applied to the tenant remote namespace and the Kubernetes resources, they come up. But I think one of the, uh, the, the other changes that, uh, that over here is um, around the Craftsman manifest folder. We'll come to that in, in a second. Uh, we already talked about the Argo manifest folder. As you see in step seven, any changes to the Argo manifest folder, they are applied to the tenant hub namespace. And you know, the deployment workflow, for example, can get modified. But any changes to the cross-plane manifest folder, they are also synced to the tenant hub namespace through a separate Argo CD application. Okay, so this is kind of the change that we have from the previous workflow, where any time a client team is adding any composite resource claims in the Crossplane Manifest folder, they are synced in real time using GitOps and applied to the tenant hub namespace. Once they are applied to the tenant hub namespace, what happens? Crossplane comes into the picture. It says, okay, these are Crossplane uh, related resources. These are composite resource claims. I understand how to sort of you know, make sense out of it. So it will do what it is expected to do. It will use the AWS provider to provision the resources in using the provider config and using the compositions in the tenant AWS account. Okay, so the resources will come up, uh, you know, as you see in step step number ten, and the tenant containers can then access the resources. So there you have it. You have your combo meal ready in this particular case uh, with Crossplane and Argo, where you're able to not only deploy your uh, Kubernetes resources, but also be able to provision your infrastructure using the same GitOps-based workflow. Okay, so with that, I'll hand it over to Gaurav to take us through the multi-tenancy and the security requirements that we have for our platform in a bit more detail, and also the solutions associated with them. Gaurav, over to yeah. you. Thank you, Vikram. Good evening, everyone. So yes, as platform engineering team, we want to make the lives of our developer easier by giving them capability to provision resources through our platform. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we don't compromise on security and performance of the existing platform. So keeping that in mind, we had few requirements. The first one was legitimate access. So what we want to make sure is that tenants are only able to provision resources in their own AWS accounts. The second requirement is related to namespace isolation. And what this means is that, as Vikram already mentioned, tenants on Adobe's internal developer platform are isolated at namespace level. And in Crossplane, there are few resources which are cluster scope. So what we want to make sure is that these cluster scope resources are used in context of the tenant namespace. We also wanted to make sure that we had policies and guardrails in place to prevent certain kind of exploits, which I will be talking about later. And lastly, about performance. We want to make sure that any existing tenant workflows or the new workflows that we introduce are not impacted in terms of performance after integration with Crossplane. So before I dive further into each of them, there was also a fundamental question that we had to address on how do we model tenants or application teams on our platform in context of Crossplane. So Crossplane has this notion of provider config, as Vikram mentioned. And through provider config, we can provide credentials which Crossplane can use to access AWS accounts and provision resources in them. So what we did as a platform team is at the time of tenant onboarding, we create a provider config for each of the AWS account that is owned by them. So in a nutshell, we have one-on-one -on -one mapping between provider config and the AWS account owned by the tenant. So now once our tenants have provider config associated with them, they can use it to interact with Crossplane. And Crossplane will assume the IAM role mentioned in the provider config to provision resources in their AWS account. So now with this setup in place, we are able to enable tenant to provision resources in their own AWS account. And that was our first requirement. Now the question is, is this good enough for preventing them from provisioning resources in someone else's AWS account? And actually the answer is no. There are a couple of loopholes here and I will highlight each one of them. So the first is the name of the provider config itself. So it is, pro provider configs are cluster scoped. So usually tenants won't have access to cluster scoped resources on the hub cluster. 
However, there is nothing preventing them from guessing the name or using some social engineering, asking their buddies on a lunch, okay, what is the provider config name for you or associated with you? I hope that doesn't happen. But in a nutshell, they can infer somehow the provider config name unless we enforce or have some mechanisms to prevent it. And we'll be talking about that later. And using provider config name for another tenant, they can use it while defining their composite resource claim, and they will be able to provision resources in someone else's AWS account. And the second issue is the confused deputy problem. A quick show of hands if you have heard about this confused deputy problem before. So few of you. Let's talk about it in more detail. So what can happen during tenant onboarding is they can specify the IAM, detail, IAM role details of an account which is not owned by them. Now cross-plane, if it is integrated with that AWS account, will go ahead and provision resources in them. So what has happened here is cross-plane assumed an IAM role of an AWS account which is not owned by the tenant, and tenant was able to make, uh, make use cross-plane to provision resources in them. And this is the confused deputy problem. So we will be talking about how we address both of these concerns. But to start with, I will mention how we mitigated the confused deputy problem. And that takes us to our next requirement as well. We want to ensure that tenants are not able to provision resources in someone else's AWS account. So what we did as a platform team is when we onboard tenants, we generate a shared secret. Now on the platform team side, what we do is we, pro we mention that shared secret in the external ID attribute of provider config. And that secret on the tenant side, they will configure it in the IAM role. And they can do so only if they own the AWS account and they have permissions to configure IAM role. Now, if they don't have that ownership of the AWS account, they may be able to specify incorrect IAM role details, but they will not be able to make cross-plane provision resources in someone else's AWS account. So with the help of shared secret, we are not only able to relate AWS account to a particular tenant, but we are also able to prevent exploits like the confused deputy problem we just talked about. Now there is also another area where we want to ensure tenant isolation, and that is the tenant hub namespaces on the hub cluster. Now as Vikram mentioned, in these tenant hub namespaces, there are tenant-specific cross-plane resources and other resources, like the composite resource claim, and we want to make sure that tenants don't have visibility to in, in each other's cross-plane resources. And that's where Argo CD rollbacks based access control helped us. We configured it to make sure that we have tenant isolation at the hub cluster level. Now the third requirement that we had is related to secrets management. Now within Adobe, the standard for secret management is Vault. So just a quick show of hand if you use Vault in your organization today. Okay, quite few of you. So you will be glad to know that Crossplane has a seamless integration with Vault. So what we have here is, we have Crossplane on our hub cluster, we are able to provision AWS resources, we have our applications running on other remote clusters, and they need to have credentials to access AWS resources. So what Crossplane offers is a notion of store config. And store config, you can think it similar to like the notion of provider config. With provider config, you access different AWS accounts. With store config, you access different secret management backends. In our case, it was HashiCorp Vault. We also configured Vault Agent Sidecar as part of Crossplane and our application deployment. And that is to make the in interaction of Crossplane and our applications with the Vault server seamless. So with this configuration is place, in place, Crossplane will be able to provision composite resources in AWS accounts, and then it will also be able to publish secrets in Vault. From the application perspective, they will be able to consume secrets from Vault and will be able to access AWS resources. So that concludes the three different requirements we had under legitimate access category. We are able to restrict tenants to their own AWS accounts. We are able to isolate them on the hub cluster at the namespace level, and we are able to integrate with Vault for secret management. Now the next requirement is related to namespace access. And Vikram already mentioned before, there are few types of resources in Crossplane, like provider config and managed resources, which are cluster scoped. We don't want our application teams to have access to these resources or use them directly. So first we will be talking about one of them, which is provider config, which is a cluster scoped resource. Now the way we expect our tenants to use Crossplane is to other composite resource claims. Now when they are authoring composite resource claim, they will be mentioning the name of provider config. 
And usually they will be using the name that is associated with them at the time of onboarding. Now, within Crossplane or Kubernetes in general, there is nothing preventing them from using a different provider config name. And we had to ensure that we build some mechanism to prevent them from using a different namespace. We want to ensure that there is a stickiness between provider config name and the tenant namespace. And there are a few ways of doing it. I will be highlighting one of them next, which is using Crossplane composition. So let's take an example. A tenant authors a composite resource claim. He's trying to provision, uh, provision resources in a different tenant's AWS account, provides a different provider config name. And what we did in, as, as part of our composition definition, we have something called patching configuration. Now here what we are doing is, we are extracting the namespace name from the composite resource claim and using it to infer the name of provider config. So this is one way of doing it. Instead of relying on what is provided by tenants as part of composite resource claim, you can infer it. And once you infer it, you can use it and prevent them from using a different provider config name than what is associated with them. Now this works in scenarios where inference is good enough, but this also helps in a couple of scenarios where we could make provider config name optional, or if it is not optional, at least we prevent them from using an invalid provider config name. Now the next type of resource, which is cluster scope level, is called managed resource. Now managed resources are part of providers that are offered as part of Crosslink project. Here I'm highlighting one of the resource, S3 bucket, which is cluster scoped and is available as part of AWS provider. Now like Vikram also highlighted, highlighted this before, we don't want our tenants to provision them directly. What is the ideal experience that we want for them? Is ideally we would like to have something, a thin composite resource wrapper for each of the managed resource and our tenants to use the concept of cross-plane claim to provision them. Now this would entail for us to build some kind of automation solution. And thanks to Christopher Haar from Crossplane community. He's from Deutsche Credit Bank, and he has built this tool and contributed to the Crossplane community. So what we did is we leveraged that tool, and we use it to read manage resource definition from AWS provider. We generate compositions, and we store them into the shared composite and composition repository. We don't directly deploy them on the hub cluster, and there is a reason for it. The reason is if we deploy them directly on hub cluster, now we are increasingly, increasing significantly number of CRDs on the hub cluster. And that may or may not impact the performance of your control plane depending on the version you are using. We'll be talking about that later on as well. And what we wanted to do is to deploy them dynamically on the hub cluster. And Vikram alluded to Argo provisioner workflow earlier as well. So what we do is in the provisioner workflow, we analyze the composite resource claims that are authored by tenants. We figure out what are the composite resources they are referencing and if they are missing on the hub cluster. And then we apply missing composites and the corresponding compositions on the hub cluster dynamically. And that's how we are minimizing the number of CRDs on our hub cluster and uh, preventing any impact on performance. So now, with this in place, when Crossplane is processing the claim object, what will happen is, a corresponding thin composite resource wrapper that we have on our hub cluster will be used to provision the managed resource. And that's how we allow our tenants to use managed resource, but in context of their own namespace. So these were the couple of requirements under the namespace access category that we had, and that concludes uh, this category of requirements. Now we'll be talking about some exploits we wanted to block. Again, these are, these are related to cluster scope nature of certain cross-plane resources. And also, as a platform team, the, our goal is to publish composite resources and compositions which have best practices of our organizations codified into them. It will be a lot of any benefit if our application teams or tenants can bypass them in any way. And that is our one requirement, not allowing teams to directly use managed resource or through any other process other than the composite resources that are blessed and published by platform team. And the second one we already talked about is how we want to restrict usage of provider config in, the, in their own tenant namespace. And uh, we talked about cross-plane composition patching for that. I'll be talking about another mechanism we could use. And what we did here is used open policy agent. So just a quick show of hands if you are aware of OPA or use it today. Nice, quite a few of you. 
And specifically, we used OPA Gatekeeper to define certain policies to prevent these exploits. There are other solutions within CS CNCF landscape like Caverno, which are also available that could be utilized. In case of Adobe, they decided to use OPA Gatekeeper. So let me show you an example of policy. Um, so yeah, so here is an example of policy. Here you can see three rules. So what first and the second rule does is, we are checking for a specific label on managed resource, which is composite.io slash composite, uh, slash comp crosslane.io slash composite, sorry. And the next one we are checking is an attribute on, um, uh, a metadata attribute on managed resource, which is owner's reference. Now what does this mean? If these two attributes are present on a managed resource, that implies it is being used in, it is being created in context of a composite resource. So that is one thing we ensure, that managed resource is being created through composite resource, uh, a related composite resource. And the next thing that we check is, we also check the API version on that composite resource, and we check it with a pattern crossplane.adobe.io. Now this, together these three rules, what it means is that any managed resource on our platform will be created through a composition process, and that composite resource would have been defined by Adobe's platform team and would have best practices uh, codified into them. Now the last requirement that I would like to highlight is related to performance. Now if anybody of you have installed Crossplane on your Kubernetes cluster and maybe add a couple of providers, what you will see is significantly there is a large number of CRDs on your cluster. In our case, we were close to 1,000. And that tests the limit of scalability of Kubernetes control plane. Now, luckily for us, Upbound and Kubernetes community, they are aware of it. They have been working together to address these challenges. In fact, I would say Crossplane is one of the first projects which were, through which it was able to uncover the scalability challenges related to number of CRDs on the cluster and is helping and working with cross, uh, Kubernetes community to address them. Now, most of these fixes are available in Kubernetes server version 1.25. They have been backported to version 22, 23, and 24. And on the client side, they have been fixed in 0.24 version of client library and backported in 22 and 23. And also shout out to Nick Cope, principal engineer at Upbound, who has uh, written in his blog post about these challenges and how these are being addressed through various versions of Kubernetes. So that summarizes all the multi tenant and security requirements that Adobe team had. And by meeting those requirements, Adobe was able to have a secure, safe, and performant cross-plane installation in their environment. So thank you, and I will be handing it back over to our friend from Adobe, Vikram, to take us through the rest of the session. Okay, thank you, Gaurav. Okay, so now, as promised, let's talk about the before and the after kind of de developer experience that we had. We already saw that you know, there are a lot of issues that the service teams and the platform teams they face with the prior solution that we had, which, where we only had like GitHub-based deployments. But with the newer solution that we have, the service teams are happy because they are able to you know, use the same uh, set of solution, same solution for the infrastructure provisioning as well. They are able to uh, specify and track the non-compute resources in the same Kubernetes native way. And they, are, they have a consistent way to sort of create and replicate environments. And as far as the platform team, they're also super happy. They're on Cloud9 because they are able to define these blessed resources in conjunction with the security teams. They're able to maintain a standardized set of templates and provisioning workflows based on GitOps. And also, there is a lot of observability and auditability that they, are, they have access to now, which was missing earlier. OK, so with that, let's talk about challenges and unknowns. As you can imagine that any solution that anyone builds, there are always challenges, there are always some unknowns that are left out, and we're still sort of figuring out some of these. So the first challenge is around the performance. So we know that there is one hub cluster. It has, uh, you know, uh, Adobe has thousands of services that will be running, and, you know, it will uh, try to sort of deploy, you know, not only doing the deployments, but infrastructure provisioning through the, through the single hub cluster. So we're trying to figure out what is the best way. Do we need multiple hub clusters in the future, or are we good? What are the limits, the true limits that we will be able to sort of reach with one hub cluster? And also the Kubernetes performance challenges that Gaurav uh, mentioned about, right? So we are still on Kubernetes 1.22 and trying to move to Kubernetes 1.23, and we need to do a little bit more testing around what kind of challenges that we will be able to sort of uh, 
uh, you know, get resolved with the latest versions of Kubernetes. The second one is, uh, you know, looking at other cloud provider support. So far, we've been focusing mostly on AWS, but there are other cloud providers in our multi-cloud journey that we have to sort of support. So we're looking at and exploring, like, you know, what are the challenges that we have? Uh, AWS is a little bit ahead uh, of the curve in terms of the providers, so we'll need to resolve the other problems as well. Technology maturity, we just talked about that, you know, Argo got graduated, but Crosspain is still an incubating project. Uh, there are some issues here and there, and I think we're trying to sort of like resolve uh, those issues in talking to the, uh, to the Crosspain community, but we, you know, the community has been very responsive. The performance issues, for example, they were resolved by the community. So we're trying to see like, you know, how uh, mature this particular technology is and what are the limits that we'll be able to reach. So there is a lot of tooling inertia also inside of Adobe, as you can imagine, right? You know, everybody is doing infrastructure provisioning already. They're using some solution or the other. Terraform is a very popular solution inside of Adobe. So there's a lot of tooling inertia associated with the existing pipelines and in the existing workflows. So we were trying to work with the teams to make sure that they understand what is the solution offering and why they have to sort of move to it. And also trying to mention that it's not about cross pin versus Terraform. It's about Crosspin and Terraform, how they can sort of work together. Also, you know, as part of like, you know, adopting a newer solution, we want to make sure that we don't really um, ask them to jump in a river full of crocodiles. We just need to make sure that we are providing a seamless path for migration to the newer workflow. So we are, we are thinking about like, what is the best way to move them from our existing workflows to the new one. And finally, we are, uh, you know, uh, dependent on the community, as you can imagine, uh, for this particular thing. And uh, also, you know, working with the community to make sure that we are able to sort of contribute upstream as well to resolve some of these issues. So with that, let us talk about how can the learnings that we uh, have had alongside AWS help you guys. And for that, I'm going to hand it over to Nima. Thank you, Vikram. So I know we took you through a lot of technical content, but you showed familiarity with Crossplane, with Argo, with OPA. So hopefully what you saw here made sense. One of the things that I want to tell you, I think I mentioned it at the beginning, it took six months for us to collaborate with Adobe and build this. But it wasn't only Adobe and, and AWS, right? Along the way, you saw that we had X generation tool from Deutsche Credit Bank. So we talked to them, we asked them to open source the project, and the project became available. We did a lot of collaboration with Upbound along the way. We also had Intuit be a partner in some of this stuff because Argo you know, has a lot of Intuit weights behind it. So that's one of the benefits of collaborating with AWS in a way. Um, you know, this is something that we do with other customers too. There is the three of us presenting the work, but there is a big team that has actually made it possible yeah. on the Adobe side, on the AWS side, and all the partners and, and, and collaborators, that, collaborators that we've worked with. So what I want to say is that this is available to you as well. Um, this is the contact information for us. You can reach out to us via email or on Twitter. And you know, if you are looking into Crossplane, if you're looking into Argo, if you're looking into running CNCF projects on top of EKS, you're not alone. AWS has a team dedicated to help customers achieve this. So please reach out. Reach out to me. Reach out to any of us. And we can connect you with the right group of people. Thank you. With that, if you have any questions, please, uh, we're ready to answer a few questions. I think we've got uh, six, seven minutes.